Halleluja. It really hit me as we were singing that we know the name of our God. We know the name of the one who created the whole universe. Can you imagine there are so many people out there who are calling upon God, but they don't know his name. And they call out the wrong name. We are so blessed to call out Jesus, Jesus. And we believe that, and we know that God hears our prayer. Amen? Amen. What a blessing it is to worship him like that. This morning, uh, this, uh, this evening, we are doing a brief overview of the wilderness journey. We're going to look at the first three campsites in detail. And this study is based off the eighth book of the History of Redemption series, entitled The Fulfillment of the Covenant of the Torch, the Ten Plagues, the Exodus, and the Entry into Canaan. So for the past couple of Wednesdays, right, we've been studying about this, right, we've left Egypt now, we've witnessed the ten signs and wonders, and we've, saw, we've seen how God just overturned Egypt. The Passover lamb has been killed, the angel of death has passed over our homes, and now we're going into the wilderness. Right? And if Egypt is the place of spiritual slavery, then the wilderness is a place of spiritual discovery. Amen? It's the place where we can discover the benefits of being in covenant with God. The New Testament likens the wilderness as the church. We are now in the wilderness and we are headed to the promised land. It's not the land of Canaan. It's the land of new heaven and new earth. Amen? So, we have all these benefits, but I, I'm not sure about you, but for me, I admit sometimes I'm not so sure if my life as a Christian is exciting as it should be. It's, it's almost as if I got used to God, right? And I'm, I'm not so sure, you know, He's this, he, I know He's amazing, I know He's this all-powerful, all-loving God who loves me so much, but I'm not sure if my Monday, my Tuesday, my Wednesday is actually walking in the greatness of God. Do you know what I mean? I pray that tonight as we study the wilderness journey, we will, uh, uh, God's Word will speak to us and we will take a step of faith in walking in the goodness and the greatness of God. Amen? Okay, so uh, scripture reading is Psalm chapter 78, verses 13 to 16. It says, He divided the sea and let them pass through it and made the water stand like a heap. In the daytime he led them with a cloud, and all the night with a fiery light. He split rocks in the wilderness, and gave them drink abundantly for, as from the deep. He made streams come out of the rock, and caused waters to flow down like rivers. That is our God. And I believe this, this God who provided for the Israelites in the wilderness, he is the same God who provides for us, Day to day. Amen. Okay, so first, we are looking at the five periods of the wilderness journey. So the wilderness journey, uh, how long did it take? When it comes to these kind of timeline and chronology issues, we usually look for what we call like a, an anchor. You know, like a ship has an anchor, right, so that it stays steady. We are looking for a timeline anchor. And in this case, we find a timeline anchor in Moses' age. Because at the start of the wilderness journey, the Exodus, right, he is 80 years old. We can see in Exodus chapter 7, verse 7. And at the end of the wilderness journey, just before the Israelites enter into Canaan, in the plains of Moab, Moses dies and he is 120 years old. So how long does the wilderness journey take? It took 40 years. So here are the five periods of the wilderness journey according to the 8th book of the History of Redemption series. And by the way, the 8th book uh, actually differs slightly. It, it has a different emphasis compared to the 2nd book. So let's see, the first period is from Egypt to Sinai. The second period is just at Sinai. The third period is the movement from Sinai, the Israelites travel to up to Rithma in Kadesh. 
The fourth period is from Rithma going in circles in the wilderness until they arrive back at Kadesh. And the fifth period is from Kadesh going to the plains of Moab where Moses dies. So in, these, in those 40 years, how many, camp, how many campsites did the Israelites have? 42, right? 42 campsites. And most of them are recorded in Numbers chapter 33. And God commands Moses to record them. It says, Numbers chapter 33, verse 2, Moses wrote down their starting places stage by stage by command of the Lord. And these are their stages according to their starting places. So it's according to God who commanded Moses, Moses, I want you to record every single detail of all these campsites. Why? Perhaps because you know, he knows that we are going to be studying this word tonight. Amen? And God wants us to know the lessons, the valuable, priceless lessons of His grace in His Word. So when Reverend Abraham Park, as he studied the Bible and prayed, he, he saw, right, he kind of organized these, the wilderness journey into five different stages of perhaps you might call it spiritual discovery, right? Each stage has a different lesson from which we can learn. It's marked by the key events. The Bible does not explicitly state that it's supposed to be divided in this way, but this is a very helpful way to organize it. Amen? So, uh, for the first period, let's look at the first period now. It's from Egypt to Sinai. So, when does it start? It starts on the 15th day of the first month, in the year 1446 BC. And how long does it last? Okay, so Numbers chapter 33, verse 3, it tells us, right, they set out from Ramses in the first month on the 15th day of the first month. So immediately after the Passover, they leave. And that's the beginning of the wilderness journey. How long does it take? Exodus chapter 19, verse 1, it tells us when they arrived at Sinai. It says, On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. Now, this actually puzzled me, and I'm sure it might puzzle you. Uh, new moon here is what we might say is an idiom, right? It's idiomatic. It doesn't actually... It, it, it might refer to an actual new moon, but the Hebrew here, it says ha-hodesh. And ha-hodesh, hodesh means month. It can mean moon, it can mean month. But when you have ha-hodesh, when ha-hodesh is like the definitive article, the month, it refers to the head of the month or the start of the month, the first day of the month. So, they arrive at Sinai on the first day of the third new moon, of the third month. So, uh, they arrive on the first day of the third month, 1446 BC. That's the first period. Okay. So, it took about 45 days for them to arrive at Sinai. That's how long the first period took. The second period, second period begins at, on the first day of the third month, 1446 BC. And how long do they remain at Sinai? They remain there for almost a year. Right? Numbers chapter 10, verses 11 to 12, it says, In the second year, in the second month, on the 20th day of the month, the cloud lifted from over the tabernacle of the testimony, and the people of Israel set out by stages from the wilderness of Sinai, and the cloud settled down in the wilderness of Paran. So this means that in total, they would have stayed in Sinai, at Sinai for 11 months and 20 days. And what does God do in those 11 months and 20 days? He gives them, he gives them two things, right? The law and the tabernacle. Right? And also at this uh, wilderness of Sinai, at, uh, they perform the first census or head count. Right? They count the number of Israelite males 20 years and above. Okay, the third period, the third period is from Sinai to Rithma, otherwise known as Kadesh. Okay, so this is where it differs from the uh, book two of the History of Redemption series. Right? So the third period... It starts on the 20th day, 
the second month, 1445 BC. And it's supposed to take them 11 days. It's supposed to take them 11 days. According to Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 2, it says, It is 11 days' journey from Horeb, otherwise known as Sinai, by way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. But this is not the path that they took. Or perhaps this is not the time that they took, right? Because actually, they took about three months to get there. How do we know? Because of all these events that took place in between, right, as they were journeying there. So the, the 11 days travel time, okay. Miriam opposes Moses, right? She speaks out against Moses, she and her brother, but Miriam is the one who gets leprosy. So for seven days, they have to stop and Miriam has to wait outside the camp, right? For seven days. Now, when they get to Rithma, they also uh, send the 12 spies and, it, and they spy the land for how many days? 40 days. 40 days. Plus, the punishment of the, the 10 spies who gave the bad report Right? The t uh, there were two spies who gave the good report, Joshua and Caleb, and then the ten spies who gave the bad report, they were punished. So it would have, this period would have lasted about three months. Now, the fourth period. Fourth period is from Rithma to Kadesh Barnea, which is basically the same location. Right? Rithma and Kadesh Barnea are the same location. And this period is the longest by far. It takes up 38 years. Why? Because of the, ten, the, the 12 spies who spied out the land for 40 days. God said, for each day that you spied out the land, I will make you wander in the wilderness for one year. Right? Numbers chapter 14, verse 34, it says, According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, a year for each day, you shall bear your iniquity 40 years and you shall know my displeasure. And after all this wandering, you know, they go in circles in the wilderness for so long. Finally, Numbers chapter 20, verse 1, it says, And the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. So why is it 38 years? Why does this period last 38 years instead of 40 years? Because uh, the 40 years was the whole wilderness journey, right? So if we, we minus off the other periods, this period lasts for 38 years. Okay. Now, what's the lesson that we might learn here? The lesson is that disobedience always results in marching in place, right? You might... We, when we... when we feel like we're serving a lot or we're doing a lot for God, but there's this part of our lives that we're actually holding back and we're being secretly disobedient. Maybe it's something we're actively doing. Maybe it's something that we are, we are letting happen in our lives that is sinful and against God's command. When we keep that disobedience and we protect it, what we're doing is we're doing a lot of marching, but we're actually just marching in place. How long are we going to keep marching like that? I pray that it will not be 38 years. Amen? So there's that part in our lives that we are, we are keeping for ourselves, that we are not surrendering to God's will. Let's surrender it and start taking a step forward in faith. Numbers chapter 14, verse 29, it says, Your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness, and all your number listed in the census from 20 years old and upward who have grumbled against me. Where is this census taken? It was taken at Mount Sinai, right? At Mount Sinai, where they counted 603,550 men, right? That census, all the Israelites born where? Born in Egypt. They died as a result of God's wrath. Now, the wilderness is, is a place, right? So we can think of it like this. The wilderness is a place where the part of us that is born in Egypt is supposed to die. And the part of us that is born anew in the church, in the wilderness, 
the second generation that is born in the wilderness, the church, that is supposed to come alive. It's a process of transition. That is our life in the church. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The wilderness journey for us is a journey where our old selves die and we put on the new self, born again in Christ. That means that, you know, whatever part of us that is obedient to God, that is Christ, is not me, is the Holy Spirit in me. Whatever part of us that's obedient to God, that's the Holy Spirit working in us. And not only is it obedient to God, it is the Spirit that loves being obedient to God's Word. Okay, that's the Holy Spirit. Okay, fifth period, Kadesh Barnea to the plains of Moab. This period takes about 11 months and it covers uh, from the first month of 1407 BC until uh, around the 12th month of 1407 BC. And in the Bible, it's from Numbers chapter 20 to Deuteronomy chapter 34. Numbers 20 to Deuteronomy chapter 34. So after wandering for 38 years, the Israelites come back to the same place. And there at Kadesh Barnea, the Israelites make their way to the promised land. Okay, and, and it takes quite some time to get there because the neighboring country, uh, you know, Edom, they, they actually could have made life a lot easier for the Israelites, but they actually refused the Israelites' entry to cross through their land. You can imagine the frustration they felt. I want to go from here to here, but there's this, you know, but these people don't let me through. And so the, the fifth period ends with Moses' death after he finishes the book. You know, the book of Deuteronomy is where Moses reiterates the law. He says the law again for the second generation in the plains of Moab. After he's done Deuteronomy chapter 34, he climbs up to Mount Nebo and he dies there. All right, so that's the first part. Let's go to the second part, the major events of the first period. We are going to look only at three campsites. Who knows what's the name of the first campsite? Sukkoth, right? Second campsite, Etham. Third campsite, before Migdal. So here is the map. I, I apologize for the resolution and the glare. Okay, so Sukkoth is located over here, the first campsite. Etham is the second campsite. And before Migdal is the third campsite. Before Migdal. Now, Sukkoth is about 52 kilometers southeast of Ramses. Southeast of Ramses. So, uh, Ramses is in Egypt. Sukkoth is 52 km away, southeast. So, it's about two days' journey. You can imagine about two million Israelites journeying, traveling together. What a huge hassle it must have been. The second campsite, Etham, is 32 kilometers away from Sukkoth. So it would have taken about a day. And the third campsite, before Migdal, is 75 km away from Etham. So it would have taken them about three days. Right, three days. Now, what major events happened here? At campsite number two, Etham, right, it says here, Exodus chapter 13, verse, verses 20 to 22, and they moved on from Sukkoth and encamped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. So God sends the pillar of cloud and fire to to shelter them and lead them through the wilderness. And you know what's amazing? What's amazing is that in the book of Revelation, there's this mighty angel that points to Christ, right? There's this mighty angel, and his body is described as 
cloud, you know, there's cloud and fire as part of his body. Revelation chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. Can you imagine, right? The pillar of cloud and fire is basically like God's legs, right? Walking alongside the Israelites in the wilderness. That is our God. From beginning until the end, from the garden even, until now, God is God, Emmanuel. Isn't that true? He is God with us. This is our God. He walks with us through the wilderness. He's always there. Whether we see Him or not, He's always there walking alongside us. Okay, campsite number three, before Mikdol. Right, Mikdol is 75 km away, right? This means that uh, the Israelites would have taken about three days to get there. And God gives them an interesting instruction here. Exodus chapter 14, verse 2, it says, this is God speaking to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of pi Hahiroth, between Migdol and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon. You shall en encamp facing it by the sea. And this whole time, right, the Israelites... Uh, the, the Israelites, as they are journeying through the wilderness, right? Pharaoh and his army, the Egyptian army, they are also chasing after them. Now God tells the Israelites, All right, I want you to go and stand in a corner and where there is no way out. How absurd, right? That's such a strange instruction. And Moses led the Israelites into such a situation. They started to panic. They started to grumble. But look at what Moses says to them. Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 to 14. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will work for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. So what's the lesson here? The lesson is, sometimes God leads us into a corner so that we would stand on the cornerstone. Amen? Who's the cornerstone? It's Christ Jesus, right? When we are backed into a corner, God, why do you bring me here? Why, why did you lead me here? And then we hold on to God. And before we realize it, our feet are only on Jesus. Both feet in. That is our, the love of God for us because He knows that everything else, we are building our house on shifting sand. Isn't that true? Only the cornerstone can save us. So this is God speaking us to us today, right? Let's take these words to heart. The Lord will fight for you. The Lord will be with us. We only have to be silent. It's better to be an Israelite trapped at the Red Sea than to be the king of Egypt. Isn't that true? Because twas only a day and the king of Egypt, his body is floating in the Red Sea, the Israelites are free. And now I'd like to conclude. In conclusion, we can walk the wilderness journey only through the pure word of God. Here I am plagiarizing Pastor Sam's Lord's Day sermon on the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Right? God commanded the Israelites to observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread since the day after the Passover, right? So immediately after the Passover, the Passover happened on the 14th day of the first month. The next day, 15th day, when they left Egypt, that was the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So for seven days, they were to eat this unleavened bread. You can see it here in Exodus chapter 13, verses 5 to 7. And when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which He swore to your fathers to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this service in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. On the which day? The seventh day, right? There shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days, no leavened bread shall be seen with you, and no leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory. 
So this unleavened bread, right, eating this unleavened bread represents the process of getting the leaven, right, the yeast that, that, that makes the bread poofy, right, and delicious, getting that out of us. Leaven, right, it makes, the, it makes the dough so nice to eat, but Matthew chapter 16, verse 12, it says that leaven represents the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Why? What's, how does leaven represent the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Because they're teaching the ways of Egypt. In Egypt, right, you are saved by what you do. That's the world, isn't that true? The world says you are saved by what you do. All I care is your performance and your results. The Feast of Unleavened Bread says that you are saved by what you trust. We eat the unleavened bread of God's Word because we trust that it is what our souls need. We tr you wouldn't eat something like, I don't know, you go to a foreign country, I won't name any country, and you see like locusts on a stick or something, and you're not so sure if the vendor is very hygienic or not. Would you dare to eat it? I wouldn't, right? I don't trust that. I don't trust it. I go to another country where the water quality, I heard, is not so good. I don't trust that water. I'm going to bring my own bottled water. Isn't that true? We eat what we trust. And in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we eat the unleavened, pure Word of God. Amen? We are saved by what we trust, by faith alone. It may not taste as good as the, the, the Word of the world or as what Satan wants us to hear, but we trust that it's the true food for our souls. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Jesus says to Satan, He says, Man shall not live by bread alone. Amen? But by every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is the word for us today. I pray, I believe, I give thanks that all of us here at Zion Church, we eat the pure, unleavened word of God. Amen? So, which day? are they to have a feast to the Lord? The seventh day, right, of this Feast of Unleavened Bread, they are to have this feast to the Lord. On the seventh day, they shall have this holy assembly. Exodus chapter 12, verse 16. On the first day, you shall hold a holy assembly, and on the seventh day, a holy assembly. So, what was the seventh day? If it, if it took the Israelites two days to, tra to travel to Sukkoth, and then another one day to travel to Atham, and then another three days to go to the Red Sea, right, before Migdal. That means that on the night of the sixth day, and this is according to Jewish tradition as well, right? Jewish tradition states that on the night of the sixth day, they crossed the Red Sea. And on the seventh day, the, e the Egyptians, their bodies were dead, and the Israelites, they walked this path that had never been walked before. You know, the Red Sea, the, the seabed, is that what you call it? The, 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 the floor, right? the ground right? of the sea. No one has walked. They didn't have scuba diving technology that, back then. right? No one has walked on that ground before. It's a completely new ground. It's a completely dry ground by the grace of God and the Israelites walked through it. I pray that as we take a step in faith, we will walk on the new ground that has never been trodden before by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. So as the people of God, we can think of it like this. We have two shoes that we need to put on for this wilderness journey. The two shoes, right? The first shoe is faith. To trust in God when things don't go our way. We need the first shoe, faith. What's the second shoe? The second shoe is obedience. Even though I, I don't quite like it, I have to sacrifice a lot. Maybe I have to... This is really what it means to pick up my cross and follow Jesus, right? So faith, and then obedience, and then faith, and obedience. And as we walk like this through the wilderness journey, through our church life, through our Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I pray and believe that the Lord will guide us into walking in the goodness and greatness of God. Amen? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time that we could study your word. 
that you have opened up the books of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy to us. What a heavenly blessing it is that you commanded Moses to record down the campsites, every single campsite that was so precious to you because you know and you knew that we would be so blessed by studying this word. Thank you, Lord. Help us to put our old selves off, to die to our old selves, Lord, and help us to put on the new self in Christ. Help us to love your word. Help us to gain this new appetite for the unleavened bread of your holy word. And Lord, help us to take steps of faith and obedience to you and whatever parts of our lives that we have been holding back from obeying your word, Lord, we repent and we say, Lord, take it all because you have given all for us. Lord, take it all from us, Lord, and help us to just follow you through this wilderness. And I pray, Lord, that you will bless Zion Church with the blessing that everyone who walks through our doors will march on to the promised land. We thank you, Lord, and we pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let us give thanks to God.